And uh, next speaker is John Dutcher. He's a professor of physics and Canada Research Chair at the University of Guelph. He is director of the Center for Food and Soft Materials Science since 1990 and director of the Nanoscience Program since 2010. Uh, Dr. Dutcher is um, specialized in matters relating to the understanding of food, food sciences, soft materials. I'm, I'm very intrigued with this, this, uh, the notion of this field. He's a fellow of the American uh, Physical Society and serves on the editorial advisory boards for Soft Matter Journal, Journal of Polymer Science, Polymer and Physics in College, and many other fascinating fields of scientific endeavor. John. Thanks, Bob. And thanks to the organizers for um, the opportunity to come here and tell you something about opportunities and challenges for nanotechnology and food, of all things. So uh, let me start by saying a little bit about nano. We've already talked about nano quite a bit. Um, to me, nano is all about materials, processes, and products at the molecular level. And the reason why this is so big, why nano is so big, uh, is that uh, we can now see atoms and molecules. We've developed techniques that allow us to actually visualize what's going on at the molecular level. And when you can see something, then you can understand it in more detail. And what people have found is that many properties of materials, when you shrink them down to the nanoscale, become different. And these might be electronic properties, mechanical properties, maybe chemical reactivity. And these are shown to be different for nanoscale materials. So that's both exciting and scary, I guess. Uh, but it, what it means is that there are opportunities to contribute to many different areas of, of technology. In terms of making nanostructures, one can think of two basic approaches. One is the so-called top-down approach, where we actually manipulate things, maybe atom by atom, as in this rather famous uh, stop-motion movie made by IBM recently. Um, and the other approach is a bottom-up approach, and that relies on the process of self-assembly. So that's actually a lot better because you get nature to, to do the work for you. Now, whether it's a top-down approach or a combination of a top-down and a bottom-up approach, most uh, of nano is engineered or synthetic in our minds, in all the products that we see in our everyday life. And, and this idea of engineered nano uh, raises concerns about safety. But not everything is engineered. There's actually a lot of nano in nature, and there's a lot of natural nano in food. And a good example of this is milk. Okay, so within milk, we have structures called casein micelles, and it's a beautiful example of self-assembled nanotechnology that we consume every day. So we have little oil droplets that are stabilized by protein layers, uh, stuck together by small particles of calcium phosphate, and this is what gives us the properties that we know and expect from natural milk. So with any technology, one can think of a sort of a, a cycle of, of activities that take place within that technology. And the same applies to nanotechnology and foods. One can think of materials, processes, and products. So with respect to nano and food, from the material side, we have, of course, nanoparticles. But uh, something that's particularly important to food are emulsions. And one can have nano emulsions and even composite materials. From processes, one can think about making molecules or extracting them from a natural source. One of the big challenges in uh, food is to solubilize uh, desirable and healthful compounds. Because most of these compounds are hydrophobic and you're trying to put them into water and that creates issues and requires you to do something more, something like encapsulating them on a nanoscale and then ultimately incorporating them into a complex formulation, which is most of food, actually. Um, if in terms of products, there are many different products that one can think about and have been realized in practice. I've pointed out a few examples here. Uh, nutrient delivery, packaging, authenticity, 
and functional foods. And I'll spend just a few minutes telling you about each of those. So in terms of delivering nutrients or other compounds, uh, you have this issue that you need to solubilize what are typically hydrophobic compounds, encapsulate them, and ultimately deliver them to the right uh, target within the body. So these might be vitamins or colors, flavors, preservatives, even antimicrobials. And so people have developed rather sophisticated delivery systems that allow them to protect a component, solubilize it, protect it, and then deliver it in a targeted fashion. With respect to food packaging, one can think of many different types of applications. One particular, particularly appealing type of application is so-called smart packaging, where you put something in the package that tells you something about the product. And so, for example, one can have an intelligent ink that's embedded within packaging. So this is an example um, of, of a particular type of, of uh, intelligent ink that is blue when it's first prepared, and when it's exposed to UV, becomes white. Okay? Um, but also, when it's exposed to oxygen, it turns back to blue. And so you can see in the sequence of these images that you can prepare a package that then tells you What's that? Oh. Uh, you can prepare a, a package that, that tells you when it's been compromised. Another area that is uh, very interesting is the idea of are you actually getting what you're paying for? So uh, this has been in the news relatively recently. Um, people buying fish and getting something much cheaper than what they thought they were getting. People buying olive oil and getting something much cheaper than what they were uh, thought they were buying. And so a technique that's particularly useful for, for tracing the uh, origin of the, the components and the authenticity of the product that you're buying is something called DNA barcoding. And I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but basically you have a short segment of DNA from an important part of the genome. And basically it's long enough that it allows you to distinguish between different types of organisms. And so just as in the supermarket where the UPC code tells you uh, which items you're, you're buying at the cash register, the same kind of principle can be applied to identifying uh, species and also ingredients in foods. The last application has to do with health issues. Food can be used for health to address diseases such as diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease. And one interesting example of this is to uh, replace trans fats with uh, oils that are more healthful while mimicking the texture of these trans fats by introducing a matrix, in this case um, something made out of ethyl cellulose, that mimics the texture and mouthfeel that you expect from a trans fat. Okay, so there are many challenges. Those are the opportunities. There are many challenges for nano and food. Technical challenges, stability of all of the nanostructures and complex formulations that you've made. Do they work? Are they, are, is there efficacy in delivering nutrients or having antimicrobial action? And then there's the issue of actually measuring somehow whether or not you have nanoparticles in a complex mixture such as a food. And I just wanted to mention that there have been some recent initiatives, one in the EU and one through the International Life Sciences Institute, in which they've tried to quantify engineered nanoparticles in foods. And that's led, in the case of this nano release group, to a number of key publications recently about, you know, how do you go about measuring uh, whether uh, you have nanoparticles in food. There are many non-technical challenges. In fact, they might be more important than the technical challenges. The first and foremost is safety. I mean, what is the fate of nanoparticles in the body? Do they bioaccumulate or can the body get rid of them? These are big issues. Um, we have regulatory uh, issues and uh, currently regulations for nanomaterials that are being developed. It's my hope that this meeting will help uh, provide some scientific input into that process. In terms of uh, whether or not consumers will actually buy this stuff, okay, sure you can make it, but will they buy it? There's a hesitancy because, maybe because of the whole GMO issue, uh, people want to be uh, better safe than sorry, basically. 
Uh, and so to get around that, I think what's needed is the idea of educating the public. And so there are various programs uh, dealing with educating people about nanotechnology, one in the US through the National Nanotechnology Initiative that starts with grade school kids, gets them exposed to concepts in nano, gets them um, uh, more knowledgeable so that hopefully they'll be able to make <laughs> informed decisions on a, a risk-benefit kind of basis. The last issue is cost, okay? Once again, sure, you can make this stuff, but whenever you make nanoparticles, functionalize their surface to achieve a certain uh, type of end goal, there's always an added cost within the manufacturing process. And the big concern is whether or not the vulnerable population that you're targeting can actually afford the technology that you're making. And this is maybe even more so within biomedicine. Um, and so, so you have this issue that people want cheap food, and will they actually buy this wonderful nanotechnology that uh, may be, uh, in fact, too expensive for them. So the path forward um, I see as having several different prongs. One is I've told you about many potential benefits, but of course the risks must be identified, quantified. You have regulations that are being developed, hopefully on a scientific basis, and I think it's important to educate consumers and the public so that they can make informed decisions. The last point that I'll raise is, is an alternate, maybe, route, where you consider doing what you might call safe, natural nano. Okay? There are many nano structures and nanoparticles in nature that can be extracted and then used for other purposes. And so an example that I'll tell you about comes out of my lab at the University of Guelph, where we discovered these very special nanoparticles in corn that are now being marketed through a startup company, Merexis. The key point here is that the particles have very special technical properties, and they can address issues not only in food and nutra, but also in cosmetics and biomedical applications, while satisfying safety, regulatory, consumer acceptance, and cost aspects. So with that, I'll finish. <laughs>